Tape with Scott. I'm the host, Scott Cunningham. I'm a professor of economics at Baylor University down here in uh, Texas. And uh, this week, I, in a previous cut of this, I had a really long thing I was saying. They got a little bit rambly. I'm going to cut to the chase. This week, we have a friend of mine, a good friend of mine that I think a lot of young people in the prof- in uh, economics know who this is. This is um, uh, a professor in the Ber- University of California Berkeley Law School. Uh, Andrew Baker. Andrew uh, wrote a paper that was published in the Journal of Financial Economics with David Larker and Charles Wang that was the winner of the Jensen Prize for the best paper published in corporate finance that year. It was called How Much Should We Trust Staggered Difference and Differences Estimates? Uh, And he's sort of been a person, uh, along with Pedro Santana, Kirill Borisak, John Roth, Brant Calloway and others, um, uh, and the Chase Martin and DeHoeful and others that that's just uh, written uh, during this kind con- has been sort of part of this um, pr- this uh, growing awareness of the problems with traditional difference and differences modeling and kind of exploring these uh, alternative methods or in flat out inventing them. Uh, Andrew didn't invent anything, but this how much should we trust staggered diff and diff is sort of a, has been an influential paper, uh, especially within finance and um, accounting. So, but Andrew also is someone that I kind of think of as a great person to hear their story. Uh, He was in economics as an undergraduate and uh, actually worked for an economic consulting firm after he graduated. But uh, he went sort of a, a different route. He did one of these joint JD PhDs. Uh, it was a PhD in the business school um, at Stanford and a JD there where he kind of continued to drink from the economics fire hose, uh, you know, st- taking a bunch of classes from Guido Embens in particular, as well as doing a pre-doc with John Donahue and uh, ended up kind of sorting into this um, area that's, uh, you know, finance and public policy. Uh, as well as law. And so I just want, and, and I just wanted, you know, to hear his story, to learn more of it. He's a, I can personally love him, you know, g- genuinely love him. I'm on a Slack channel uh, with him and a, and Pedro and Andrew Gibbon Bacon. And it was uh, to write a paper. And of course, I don't know what happens on productive Slack channels. I don't know if these, if people are actually getting work done. All we do is make jokes and become better friends. And so um, I've come to love him a great deal. I think that a lot of you people probably do appreciate his wit and his uh, kind of approach. So anyway, uh, this is Andrew Baker. He's professor of law at University of California, Berkeley. And I'm going to turn it over uh, to listen to him. Thanks so much for, for tuning in. And if you like this kind of stuff, uh, if you could like it, uh, share it, et cetera, follow it at, um, thanks a lot for doing that, even if you don't. See you. Well, uh, it's my pleasure to have uh, a person that I've been fortunate enough to become uh, what I consider a friend of mine, uh, Andrew Baker. Andrew, thanks for being on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me, bud. Uh, well, for the sake of the the listener, can you tell us uh, where you work and what your title is and stuff like that? Yeah, so I'm a, an assistant professor of law at Berkeley Law School. Um, I teach kind of business law and securities uh, regulation. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm a law professor. Cool. All right. Well, let's get off and started. So um, uh, before we get into it, I have like a little icebreaker. Yeah. Uh, you know, so when you reflect on uh, any vacation that you've ever had, whether it was a kid, whether it was older, whether it was recent, What's a what's a vacation that you've had that uh, you still think about every now and then? Doesn't mean it's your favorite, but it kind of like you've noticed that you've thought about it a little bit. It's a good one. Uh, well, one I just thought about the other day. So there was this video of um, these people in like some sound off of Vancouver. And it was like the lady woke them up at 630 in the morning to come see these humpback whales. And my first thought was like, I'd be pissed. Like six thirty, I'm trying to sleep. And it reminded me of my wife and I. Um, uh, we when we started dating, we went on a trip to Panama, like two or three uh, 
um, months after we had started dating, like not that long, but I had like moved to California and had been working and was like, I, I want to go on a trip. Like if you want to come. And so we went, we didn't really know much there, but we, we ended up staying on this Island off of Panama for a little bit. And like, uh, we were staying at, it was like an Airbnb kind of, it was not an Airbnb. It was almost like a little like mini hostel at these, environmentalist ran yeah. and so they were like obsessed with the environment it had like all these crazy frogs and all this stuff it was cool but we were not coming back after like a long day and they were like we were like crossing them on this narrow path in our car and they were like andrew like jasmine you need to come the like huge mega turtles are on the beach hatching like this never happens like the people go there specifically for this and we were like yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> like, go? we're gonna go back and just like take a nap <laughs> to netflix and they were just like the look on their face was just like is that when you knew that you and jasmine were meant for each other yeah. and neither Maybe. one of you cared about the turtles yeah. <laughs> see, well, i just will never forget what's what's that hold on i lost you wait i can't hear you for some reason hold on okay oh okay that's funny well, yeah. tell me where you grew up, man. Where where did you grow up? So I grew up in um, West Hartford, Connecticut, um, kind of a medium sized town, probably very similar to the you know little Mississippi shanty that you grew up in. Um, I imagine. <laughs> yes, yeah, I bet it was just like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, so yeah, I'm an East Coast guy originally. Um, okay. Yeah. Huh? How big was that little town? That was like. 60 65,000 so it's kind of okay. a suburb of 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 Hartford obviously. Um, oh okay. Okay. Yeah, and so um yeah, I actually you know didn't mind where I grew up. I was really ready to get out of there by the time um it was over and I uh, you know I've never gone back. My family doesn't live there anymore, so I don't uh -huh. really go back too too frequently, but it was a good place to grow up. It was kind of mm -hmm. not the like Connecticut. It was not, our town was very nice, but it was not like, you know, like Greenwich or some of the places that you kind of think of of, of Connecticut. Uh, okay. Kind okay. of like in the middle. Yeah. Um but it was like, you know, we had really, really good public schools. Um mm. and so kind of feel very lucky. I got went to college and was able to make fun of all my friends who went to private school because I was like, yeah. I went to public school. I'm better than you. Um but meanwhile, <laughs> my my parents capitalized all that cost into the uh, into their mortgage but um yeah no it was really good public schools and um you know still have a lot of good friends from growing up but um but but yeah now now i've been on the west coast for about um like 13 years almost oh. what'd your what'd your parents do for a living um so my mom took a bunch of time off of work after the kids were born um and kind of raised us for a little bit and then she went back and she um first worked for like chico's like the the women's clothing store Oh. Uh, and she kind of sold the advertising for like one of like the local uh, newspaper, like West Hartford News. She would like okay. kind of she got to know like the businesses in town and sold the uh, sold sold kind of advertising in the local paper. And my dad actually sold bridges. Bridges. Yeah. How do you get into that kind of thing? He's an engineer or something? No, he's not. He's a sales just salesperson. Um, so it's mostly like. Um, uh, like commuter bridges and things so it's not like you know selling like the golden gate bridge or you know something like that it's mostly like highway bridges oh. and so there's a company I, don't, I actually don't know exactly how he first worked for this company called hilti which you probably know like like tools and things like that huh. um, and then that was like when i was born and then he moved to this bridging company presumably like there's just sales um like he thought about like, that huh yeah, so he, it's a job that I don't think really exists anymore, to be honest, um, yeah. because like his job was to pretty much like come up with bids and like bid against rival yeah. companies. And like, I just right. wonder how much of that um, is now completely automated in terms right. of, you know what I mean? Like the expertise you need to figure out what the winning bid will be. Oh, and yeah. It's interesting to hear him talk about like, you know, the strategy you'd have to do of like, you know, trying to figure out who else was going to bid and what the right bid was. And I just feel like mm -hmm. so much of that now must be. Yeah, just, sure. Sure. I never even thought about that. Well, so what kind of games and stuff did you do when you were little? What, what, what kind of stuff were you? What kind of kid were you? Um, I think I was a real pain in the ass, um, <laughs> which I think is like carried forward. You know, I don't hide anything. Probably, yeah, I can't. I mean, yeah. I, it seems yeah, like I, it must have been a different kid back then. Yeah, I feel like I relied on the fact that like I got good grades to just like get me off the hook for just being a general overall pain in the ass. And like now <laughs> that I'm a parent, I kind of... Um, and like suffering the consequences of that, you know, I feel like, you know, the karmic balance of the universe is <laughs> whipping back around. Um, but yeah, no, like uh, growing up, I mean, I was, 
I was like reading when I was a kid. So, um, you know, I started reading early and I, you know, I was into school and I like reading. Um, I played sports. I was a big lacrosse player. It was kind of my, my main sport. Um, but growing up, I also played soccer and some other stuff. Um, I was never that into video games. I was really bad at them for the most part. Um, really enjoyed kind of, uh, smoking weed with my friends for a good part of my childhood. Um, you know, just general suburban, suburban life stuff. Well, what'd you want to be when you, when you were like, you know, in middle school, what'd you want to be when you grew up? You're smart. You know, when, you're good. I, when I was younger, I actually really wanted to be an engineer. Um, I think it's because like my dad worked with a lot of engineers, even though he was an engineer. And I really liked math when I was younger. So I had like skipped a grade in math, um, was really into math. And I thought that's what I wanted to do. And then kind of like 9-11 happened when I was in eighth grade. And then I just got really kind of into more into politics. And mm. just I, I regret it a lot. I kind of just stopped with math. Uh, at a certain point, I like skipped a grade. I took a when I was like a junior, I took like I don't know, Calc three or something like that. Like the local college, they had like school district had to pay for me to go there. Mm. And, you know, like I, but then I, I just kind of got over it. I hadn't realized at that point that like you would be using math for all of the stuff that, you know, we are interested in, you know, I, I, I kind of in my mind, it was like math was for doing engineering oh. or something like that. And um, so, yeah, I originally thought sort I was sort of were substituting into this interest that you had and, in politics and you sort of put behind the mathematics yeah i just kind of like stopped and and um yeah and so like i went to georgetown thinking that i was going to be really interested in doing politics um yeah. and after like six months i was like oh this is actually miserable i don't want to do politics um the, the idea of like when you say politics what do you mean you thought you wanted to be a politician no not necessarily be a politician i mean so i went to like the foreign service school at georgetown and thought yeah. i'd be interested in something like that. Um, I mean, I, I kind of went in thinking some kind of international politics, maybe something like the foreign service or something related to that, like but being within the political system in some, some way. Yeah. Um, and then I kind of got disabused of that kind of, I don't, I don't know. I just saw what it was actually like and, and didn't really want to do that. You chose, um, you chose Georgetown because it had this Edmund school of foreign service. Like you were in high school and you were like, Georgetown has this thing called Edmund School of yeah. Foreign Service. I want to do foreign service. That's That was your brain? Well, kind of. It was actually kind of funny because actually my dream school all along was UNC. Um, and Chapel I applied. Hill. You wanted to go to Chapel Hill? I wanted to go to Chapel Hill. I loved it. Like the campus was beautiful. The weather, people. Mm -hmm. uh, I like really, that's where I really wanted to go. And I got in and I was like set on going, but I applied to this foreign service school and didn't really think about it. And then I got in and I remember my mom was like, are you really not going to do that? Like, you think you want to do, you know, this type of stuff? Like, it seems really stupid. So my mom kind of convinced me that it was the right call and I did it. And then I immediately decided I didn't want to. And I spent most of college regretting not, not being in Chapel Hill. Uh, what was it, Chapel Hill? I just liked it, man. I just, it was like a big public school. I don't know. I went to Georgetown and it was full of like, you know, private, it, it took a little while to kind of, I mean, I liked being in DC and being in a city, but I, I feel like I probably would have just had more fun and, and fit in a little more at, at Chapel Hill, at least the first couple of years before I found like my group of friends. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, so UNC was like my dream, my dream school. I used to like love watching Chapel Hill basketball growing up and mm -hmm. um yeah, that's what I was thinking. It's funny to think how your life would, would turn out differently if you had just made different random choices when you were yeah. 17 years old. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, so how do you end up at, so the the Edmund School, that's not where the economics department is, but there's something called an international economics degree inside that? Yeah, so like the Foreign Service School has a bunch of degrees within it, and they're like you're essentially taking the same the same classes as the econ majors. It's just like you take a few different other things. Um, so there wasn't much of like an international focus more than if you were just kind of like an econ major at Georgetown. Um, you didn't have to do international economics, though, did you? You could have done other majors. Yeah, so there's like internet. They just put international in the front of a bunch of different majors that exist in other places. It's like inter you, you either are international politics, international political economy, international right. economics, something else. I don't know. When I was at Georgetown, I actually thought I really wanted to do like development economics. So mm. I had like get into development economics, and that was a lot of the classes I took that I was focused on. Mm -hmm. um, Hold on, I lost you again. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. That's, uh,
tinkered with my headphone thing. Um, yeah, so I, I thought I was going to be interested in development economics. Um, and so most of the classes I took were around that. The internships I did were were about that. I, I interned with like the Center for Global Development. Um, and so that was more of my focus at that point in time. Um, and then, you know, I actually applied for some jobs to do that right out of school and just kind of ended up not doing it. And then just kind of life went a different way. Hmm. What'd you like about economics in, at, in college? How quickly did you find it? Yeah. I mean, I think I kind of, I even did like AP economics when in I was high in school. school. Yeah. And so I kind of came in taking, um, I like placed out of like introductory micro and that stuff. So I was taking economics classes from the jump. Um, mm. you know, what did I like about it? I mean, uh, I liked, especially at Georgetown, because it was, I was in this kind of like international focus. So I was taking a lot of classes about international stuff, but then it allowed me to kind of use math stuff that I, that came easier to me, um, uh, you know, in that way. And, and so I, you know, I ended up. But your uh, first love was this like policy public, how would you describe your, your kind of mind in high school, your home was not necessarily in like a philosophy, but like in what, like service or something? No, I mean, I think I was like, you know, I don't know. The way I always think about it is, I mean, I was interested in math. I was taking a lot of math classes. 9-11 happened and it just I just still remember like the first formative years of my kind of, you know, young adulthood, I guess, of being just like watching the news nonstop, you know, like following what was going on in Iraq uh following you know all the the protests the developments uh you know the bush years uh and kind of how much of my psyche and persona got wrapped up into to all of that um what's that you know, that's college that's when you're how well, old this was like high school uh, oh, college, so 9 no, I, I was in, yeah i was in college from 06 to 10 pretty much oh, so okay. like halfway through obama got elected so i was um first last two years of the Bush administration, but like for most of my high school and like late middle school was kind of the Bush administration. Yeah. And I don't know, it's just what became, I mean, I don't know if it was, I don't think it was that way for everybody, but I also think it was that way for a lot of kids of my kind of age, my vintage mm -hmm. talk to like of kind of, you know, coming of age following 9-11 and the catastrophe of the Bush administration, mm -hmm. then going to college and having the economy collapse halfway through and the job market collapse, right? And so- um, it's kind of interesting to think about how those things like determine, you know, it's kind of like the, you know, senior macroeconomists of today who just simply can't get over like hyperinflation of the 70s. And so kind of lets it color everything that they think about the world. And I think there's, mm. some, there's some aspect of that for us in our generation of thinking about the things that, you know, will always stick with us. Um, mm. Yeah. So that was, I think, kind of like the development of like uh, how I got into things. And so then I got. Yeah, but I don't then, know like I what what are you okay I get that but then like what are you drawn into for this like international it's because you're not like you're not being drawn into this economics degree because you're like yeah I read uh about the invisible hand or I saw a supply and demand curve and like or I read Becker's thing or something like what exactly is drawing you to the economics of connecting it to 9-11 what what exactly is going on no, I don't think that even the economics connected it to me. So like the way it works is if you apply, when you apply to Georgetown, you apply to one of the schools. And so you're, I just applied to the foreign service school. Honestly, it wasn't even, there's a, bo a box that you checked on the application. Oh, okay. At that point, I was like, you could apply to something called the college, you could apply to the nursing school, or you could apply to the foreign service school. And I was like, foreign service school sounds cool. Like, yeah. and it's kind of like a, a prestigious thing within Georgetown, which I knew when I visited it. And so I just checked the box. And so got once it. you're there, you got to pick one of these majors, you're second or third year, I can't remember. Um, and so then within there, you're sitting there and it's like, you either do international economics, international politics. I was always a little more on the economics, the end within my classes. Um, so it, it seemed natural. My advisor was a, an economist, this guy, Mitch Kaneda, um, who I think is still there actually. Um, and he was kind of my faculty advisor. You, you get paired up with one when you're at the foreign service school. J just seemed natural was most of the classes I was taking. Um, but yeah, I, don't, I mean, I think it was kind of just just I, I found economic classes and uh, economics classes interesting on their own, regardless of, mm. kind of like, what I wanted to use them for. And yeah. then you realize halfway through college, the instrumental value of different degrees. Right. And different classes. And, and you know, obviously, um, 
taking economics classes carries benefits and, and, you know, learning skills that you can take with you. I mean, I didn't learn nearly enough when I was an undergrad, like my coding mm -hmm. skills were minimal in comparison to, you know, we're interviewing pre-docs and stuff right now. And it's just insane how much yeah. more developed these kids are than I was yep. at their, at their stage, but still like being able to do something and play with data and do internships where I was helping people do research and you realize, mm -hmm. you know, playing with data is fun. Um, and, uh, and yeah, I think that's kind of, you know, I don't think there was a whole lot of thought with 18 year old Andrew besides mm -hmm. kind of, you know, just one step after another, but kind of just how I stumbled into it. Yeah. Well, so when you're at the end of Georgetown, uh, you know, when you think back again to the, what you wanted your life to be about, what were you thinking about at the very end when you graduated? Yeah, man, I was, I've been thinking about this recently. I didn't know. I really didn't know. I had had kind of a rough college experience a little bit. Um, you know, so my, um, sophomore year, my best friend passed away. Um, like I was the one who found him. We were at a party and kind of, mm -hmm unfortunate circumstances and then like a year later my mom passed away suddenly so I kind of was just getting through college for the most part um and so then when I I actually graduated a semester early because I just had enough AP credits and it felt ridiculous to make my dad spend another thirty thousand dollars just to just to stay so I kind of like I was just getting through man I went and traveled like right out, like when I when I I went and I lived with my dad for like a month or two um as he was settling into whatever his new life is. And then I went and I did this trip to Central America. I went to Costa Rica and volunteered a little bit. And then I met up with some friends from Georgetown on their spring break in Nicaragua. And then I went back to DC and was waiting tables at the restaurant I worked at and just trying to figure out what the next step was. Mm -hmm. And I really, I mean, I was applying for jobs and I think people kind of knew like this kid has no idea like what he wants to do and mm -hmm. like interviewing and not getting jobs. I remember I accidentally interviewed at AEI. Um, I had no idea what it was. And I got oh, yeah. in, why are there pictures of Newt Gingrich everywhere? You know, <laughs> they get in this interview and they're like, you know, it was like, I was just lying. He robbed that people. interview. It probably. Um, yeah, I don't think it went well. <laughs> I remember too, the one was like, uh, I, I interviewed with the Federal Reserve Bank in New York, man. And this was the roughest interview I've ever had. It was like, the guy was being like, all right, so like, assume that there's a shock to interest rates and it goes, you know, like, like literally grilling me on like the underpinnings of like macroeconomics. So, <laughs> I don't know, man, supply goes up. Goes up. <laughs> you know, I just, I was like, I was totally, people were like studying for these interviews and prepping and I was just kind of sleepwalking through everything at that point. Yeah. Well, so what happens? How long are you out of school? How long between grad school and, and graduation of, from undergrad? How long is that? Yeah, it was like probably three or four years. So yeah, pretty much cool. I was in DC. I was waiting tables. So um, you hung around. You stayed in DC for all this time. No, no, no. So what happened was I was in DC. I was waiting tables. I was applying for jobs. I wasn't having very much luck. I mean, it was only a couple months. It wasn't like super, super long. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was just like, I don't know. I, I kind of got an itch. I was like, I just need to not be here. Um, I was yeah. kind of hanging out with all my friends from college doing the same thing. So I just moved to California. Oh, like, you just moved out to the Bay Area? Yeah. Yeah, to the Bay Area, didn't have a job, um, you know, so my my fr my best friend who passed away, I met this guy um, that was his really good friend at his funeral, actually. Um, oh. And so he came out and he lived in San Francisco at that point, and his name was Joe Bear, and he was just like this amazing guy, and, and we had kind of all gone out to California my senior year to like go do a trip with him, uh, just to like, you know, some of the friends that our friend had made when he was in college. And so we went out there, a few of our friends, and like I'd never been before. And we like went to this lake and hung out in San Francisco and it was awesome. And I was just like, you know, I want to try something different. And so I went yeah. and I asked him if I could sleep on his couch for a little bit. And I was like trying to trying to get restaurant jobs for a few weeks. And I um I actually finally just did like the whole point of like why you get an expensive degree, which was like found out that there was an alumni network website. Um mm -hmm. and just sent an email to somebody who was working in economic consulting in the Bay area and was like, you know, I see you on the alumni network. Um, you know, I'm, I'm interested. I'm an undergrad, you know, international economics major. Um, and then I ended up landing that an interview at that place. Um, and that, you yeah. have, are you, do you, do you have at this point, like quantitative background, a quantitative background? I mean, that's like, you know, for the sake of the listener, that's one of the things I've always, you know, noticed is the, uh, how natural it all comes to you. So like, you know, do you have that in college and gradu after graduation, this skill, this skill set? 
Uh, you know, I didn't have a ton of coding experience at all. And so this job, like the, the econ consulting jobs are actually really kind of useful in terms of getting training, um, like mm. on the job training, right? And so these are kind of cases where you're you're supporting economic experts, right? Some of these firms like analysis group, they have experts who are like university professors and they yeah. they provide some of the work for them. There are other companies where it's like the experts are kind of in-house and full-time or full-time. And so ours was one of those shops. Yeah. I mean, I came in, I think I had good intuition, but I didn't have like, like I didn't know how to use Excel well, even I didn't, mm. you know, I used Stata in classes, but my use of it was very, very minimal at that point. Mm. Uh, and so I kind of learned on the job kind of how to actually do stuff, but I really liked it. I found the work super interesting. So I worked really, really hard. I was working like- You found the work interesting and the programming interesting or is the programming- Yeah, yeah, like it was fun. So yeah, yeah, yeah. For both of them and the work. So so this is, so our shop, so now I my I, I study, we can talk about this later, but I, I study kind of like law and finance. At this point, I knew nothing about finance and I, I mm. never really taken any finance classes. I knew very little. Um, and uh, and this was like in the wake of the financial crisis. And we were working on all of these cases about the financial crisis. So I didn't even know. I mean, I knew that banks had collapsed, but, you know, I spent a lot of time just reading books, figuring out what it was. I mean, we were working on cases about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. We were working on yeah. cases about AIG. I got to work on Madoff cases and go to Vienna, Austria, uh, uh, go to Austria to like, you know, work on. Uh, mapping feeder funds to Madoff funds. Like I, you know, mm -hmm. as like a 22, 23 year old kid, I was getting to work on really big cases and do cool stuff. And, wow. uh, you know, so like that was, and now this is the type of stuff that I, that I study. So, uh, you know, I always think about that, that I, I worry that we like force these kids to like know what they want to do nowadays yeah. at such an early age. Um, and people have talked about this a lot. It's part of the reason why I find things like pre-docs and all this to be actually be good. Mm -hmm. Where Everybody else thinks that it's just another, you know, just extending the time frame. And I, I think there's something to that if you know exactly what you want to do. But I don't know how you're supposed to know what you want to do. It's such totally. a, like yeah. I would be doing something. I'd be like, you know, studying latrines in like Tanzania right now, which like maybe that would be a better use of my time. But like uh, I, I don't think I would be happier doing that than what mm. I am now. So, um, so, yeah, that job was like pretty formative for me. And I had like a lot mm. of really good mentors who kind of helped me a lot. Um would you start to notice about yourself and your your like your interest, you know, while you're at that job? Is it that you were like it was the finance part? You started to kind of see that that you actually really thought you loved the finance or is it still the public policy elements or what's the deal? Yeah, I mean, I don't like love finance, qua finance, like in terms of like, you know, figuring out how to calculate a weighted average cost of capital or something like that. Right. But, but, you know, at that point in time, what were like some of the big policy questions that were going on in the, yeah. Obama, you know, administration was yeah, topics that we were doing and, you know, kind of realizing like, if you care about the things that I cared about, which was kind of just general, you know, societal concerns and how we figure out how to set up a public policy that works. A lot of it was about mm. finance at that point, um, mm. you know, it was about how we think about designing structures so that this stuff doesn't happen. And so getting to kind of like work on cases about the actual collapse and spending a bunch of time just like reading books, mm. you know, about the financial collapse and trying to figure out exactly, you know, what were the kind of mechanism design flaws that led to all of this? Like what were the regulatory failures? Um, so, you know, that wasn't what I was doing on a day-to-day -day basis, but it yeah. gave me the opportunity and the skills to kind of like under, and the know-how to like kind of understand what was going on in a way that I, I didn't previously. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, I mean, I think that was, you know, and then I, I ended up leaving after a few years, um, knowing that what I wanted to study more was stuff at the intersection of kind of public policy and financial markets, mm. corporate governance, kind of some of these, uh, these type of topics that, that now is what I, what I study and what I'm interested in. And before that job, I would have like had very little kind of idea that it was something I would find interesting. Yeah, totally, man. Yeah. I can see how that would evolve kind of coalesced those that historical kind of interest in politics and then this math and and then this this job where all this context is going on you're you, so so how you're only there a couple of years and then you kind of you reach a point where you say i want to be what a professor or what's the, what are you missing in your life where you feel like i need to go back to school yeah, I mean, so it was an insane job. 
like it was fun and I'm glad I did it, but we were pretty much, we were, um, there was this former company called LECG, which was a Berkeley kind of shop actually. So it was like started by David Teese and a bunch of other Berkeley law, uh, not Berkeley law, but Berkeley economics professors and Berkeley business professors. Mm. Um, LECG went bankrupt because they hired too many people. They spun off this group, which was just the finance group of LECG. And so that's mm. what I was working for. Oh. And essentially there was a standalone unit that more or less, you know, my boss was trying to get purchased by one of the other shops. These are firms like, you know, uh, Cornerstone, Compass Lexicon, right? You've probably yeah. seen some of these. And so we were working just, we had so much more work than, than we had people. And so I was working like really like 80 hour weeks, quite mm -hmm. frequently, like, you know, I was burnt out at the, at the end of it. Um, and so I was ready for something. And, and what actually happened, I'd started to think I was ready But I had applied when I applied, was applying for all these jobs when I moved to San Francisco. I'd applied for like a pre-doc position um, at Stanford. And then they reached back out to me like two years later. They were like, we have your like, resume on file and we're looking to hire somebody again. And oh, at that point, I was like kind of ready. Yeah, it was another one of these kind of serendipitous things that just happened. Um, and so then I just sent my updated resume and was like, yeah, I'd be interested in this. And it was a way to kind of transition more into Uh, areas of things that I was interested in, but still kind of staying in the the space of kind of um, kind of econ e work. Um, and so, yeah, I thought it was a good opportunity to figure out what my next steps were going to be. I knew I was going to apply to some school. I wasn't sure I was going to apply to law school at that point. I was thinking more of a PhD. Um, but you know, even then, the kind of realizing that a pre doc was a good opportunity. It was like a lot less formalized than it is today. Mm. But But yeah, that's, so uh, you know, got that. So it was an econ pre-doc or what was it? Yeah. So it was at the law school, but it was with John Donahue. John Donahue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Right. So he had a few pre-docs and so he's a, an economist and lawyer. Um, and so I was mostly working on stuff outside the area of, of what I'm kind of mostly interested in, mm -hmm. but um, it was kind of crime research. We, I was working primarily on gun control research. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Wait, you were yeah. involved in that synthetic control study? I was not, but I, I was uh, uh, one of the people on that paper, Michael Weber, um, uh, uh, was, I think that was his name. He, him and I were pre-doc at the same time. So he was actually working on the, he he came up with the idea, I think, or him and him. And I think Obey was on that paper too, who's now my colleague, um, who was mm -hmm. a former pre-doc of John as well. But I was working on um, kind of a response to the NRC report about um, kind of, They had come out with a report saying, you know, we're going to analyze John's work and John Lott's work, and we're going to come down on which That was side. a long time ago, wasn't it? The long time ago. The report was a long time before, and, you know, even the project that I was working on. Um, and then we were still responding. John's been working on this stuff for decades. I don't know how he has the fortitude to continue on um, with these battles, but he does. And so, yeah, that's mostly what I was working on. There was a little bit of capital um, punishment work, too. Mm. Um, but primarily on gun control stuff. Um, yeah, and the Joanna Shepard, Paul Rubin stuff. Uh, so our the stuff that I worked on there was he he worked he was the 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 main expert on this long running death penalty case in Connecticut. Oh, right. And so he ended up doing some academic research from it, which was mostly just kind of formalizing what his report is, was. Is it something about African Americans? Yeah, so it's Where kind of like I get it more. Yeah, and I think, the crime or something. Yeah, then like it's just it's it's kind of saying that the the way that the death penalty is implemented is kind of arbitrary or and or biased, both yeah. both based on if the perpetrator and also who the um, um who the victim is too. So kind of yeah, right. I remember this. Stuff. I remember the paper. Yeah. This is a common, it's a common attack on the death penalty through different states. I mean, it's not like um, John's the first one had done this, but it comes yeah. down to statistical analysis of kind of what are the cases that could potentially be charged, mm -hmm. who gets charged, um, and trying to commit. And he ultimately was successful. I mean, it took him, he worked on that case for a very, very long time. Um, I have a lot of a lot of just respect for John as it is, but also he has like an insane stamina to keep with these things for, for a really long time. So, yeah. yeah. So, so then that was probably pretty important because you're, he's, PhD JD. Yeah. And yeah. So, so you, I didn't know before then if I wanted to do law or not. Um, and he kind of uh, talking with him and being there um, and seeing the stuff that kind of JDs and PhDs were doing kind of convinced me to, to apply to law school too. Was there a time where you were thinking about the PhD in economics though? 
Yeah, I actually applied the year I applied to law schools. I applied to a bunch of PhD programs too. I didn't get into any. Uh, I just, like I said, I didn't stop taking math for the most part. And so they probably I heard what happened in the, at that AEI interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, forget it. This guy's in trouble. Yeah. Or the, the, the Fed interview. <laughs> we well, don't want him, man. That's yeah, right. Really. No, he's act like you didn't want us. It's the other way. Yeah, uh, exactly. Right. So, no, I applied and then I, um, yeah. So, I, then I just, I got into law school though. So, I figured yeah. I'd start law school. Oh, so you I, just got into the law school. You didn't do one of these joint PhD, JD things. No, I, well, I did end up doing it, but you did I did do it, but I started law school and then I ended up um, taking, I, I, you can do like a, a master's in econ uh, at Stanford. And so okay. I started doing that. And so I took the kind of like first year sequ micro sequence um, and then reapplied and got into a PhD at the business school in my second year. And What's so then it my called? It's, it's called business something. Uh, so everybody who gets a PhD from the business school, you get a PhD technically in business administration. Yes. Like different focuses, right? And so ours, my group um, was the accounting group. There's finance, uh, political mm. economy, organizational behavior, technically on like our degrees it also has like phd in business administration mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so i was wrote this question down uh then i was going to kind of transition into your 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 career now so one of the things that uh um first i'll just say this you know this is something i've noticed one of the things i've noticed about you and your and many people are in your general circle of influence is that you kind of do remind me of this younger group of people you kind of mentioned that it's even you're noticing it even more but like i've noticed it with you who are these kinds of like fairly sophisticated practical computer scientists this social scientist and this kind of i was struggling to find the word but like pragmatic philo philosopher about society and rules but it's like you had a different way of saying it you said general well-being is that right? Is that what you said? That's kind of your interest is like, you're not like, it's not like you were like, well, I read von Mises or whatever. And now I'm like, you know, I got this like full apparatus in my head. You're just, you've yeah. kind of got this like down homey kind of like common sense approach. Is that right? Or what do yeah. I think? Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of get what you're saying. I mean, I don't think I have extremely focused interests necessarily in the way that some other people do. Like, I think, you know, I mean, I have certain areas of things I focus on and study. Um, for me, I always like, I mean, I still kind of try to read a lot. I, I try to be like, I, I mean, I'm most more interested in kind of, I don't know, thinking about the state of the world, the country, right? And thinking about how, how our different research ties in versus, I mean, we can talk about the, you know, benefits and flaws of different approaches, but like the hyper-specialization of a PhD these days, right? I mean, people come out with just like an insane amount of knowledge on one specific topic. Like I actually really like being at a law school because when I go to our seminars, they're on completely different topics, right? I mean, I, I remember when I was at, at Stanford as a law student, I would always go to the seminars because like 10 students could go and like the food was way better than what we get as students and like nobody ever went. And it would be like, you know, talks about like disability law during the Civil War or something, you know? And it's like, it's super interesting. I wouldn't know this otherwise. Like I like to read books about things that aren't economics, right? Um, and so I, I think I have a fairly like kind of like broader but not focused interest typically but then yeah. i guess i match that with like i don't know i spend a lot of time thinking about how to estimate stuff um so it's kind of like this 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 yin and yang of like on the one hand uh i don't know i think my my overall interests are, are somewhat broad but then um you know i spent a lot of time in the phd just trying to figure out you know this is how we got to know each other kind of trying yeah. to figure out how to do things and 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 realizing that like i could continue to write papers doing things wrong and ask all these different questions. Um, but I spent just kind of like a bunch of time trying to figure out, you know, for, at least from an econometric perspective, like how do we, how should we think about this? Um, the yeah. area I'm in is, you know, a lot of difference and differences and, you know, like uh, I kind of got think got to thinking like if this stuff doesn't work here, like does, does it not work for all the stuff that we've done, all the stuff we think we know about this topic? And so then to some extent, a lot of my papers are kind of like hyper specialized on like specific kind of methodological critiques or contributions, um, which, you know, for better or worse, maybe for worse. Um, but, uh, but, but yeah, I think that's kind of like my general read, I guess, on myself as a. Yeah, sure. I mean, I guess, you know, you, you had the the fortune of like, you know, 
being uh, right in the middle of that like credibility crisis of diff and diff. And so you've got this big paper uh, on diff and diff that's applied in your field, but, um, and it wins an award, right? The, it wins like paper of the year for that journal. It was like the corporate finance paper of the year. Yeah. In the, in the JFE. Yeah. 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 So, but that's not your primary interest, right? Is that what you're sort of saying? Your, your primary, your primary love is not, is not like a methods love. It's a, is it a, is it a methods love or is it more of like a topic thing that you're more, you're like moving more into the, these specific topics now that you're interested in? Yeah. I never would have considered myself like per se, like a methods person. Um, I think I'm, you know, I'm much less than obviously the people we work with mm -hmm. either, either Andrew or certainly Pedro. And then even people like Kareel, right. Who like is not just a methods person, but, but does, like really cares a lot about kind of formally proving this stuff. I mean, my interest, and I think people think that I'm like maybe more of a methods person than I am. People ask me to give talks and stuff. Um, mine was really like, the, the way that paper started was my co-author, Charlie, was at a conference with me and we were talking about... Um, well, for the sake of the listener, will you say the name of the the name of the paper in the journal it was published in? Like, uh, I give a little background? The paper you were was... The background. We stole, we stole our title from um, uh, from um, Bertrand and Molinothan and it was, yeah. how much did you trust staggered difference and differences instead of how much did you trust difference and differences? Yeah. Complete lack of cre creativity on our site. <laughs> uh, it was published in the Journal of Financial Economics and the way that started was there's this long literature um, in law and finance about staggered boards. Okay, so what these are, these are, um, and not just staggered boards. In particular, what we were looking at is anti-takeover statutes. Mm -hmm. And so what these are are um, statutes passed by state legislatures that are intended somewhat to um, entrench management to make it harder to get rid of managers. Okay, mm -hmm. and so. There's been a long literature starting, not starting completely, but like really starting in earnest with a paper by Bertrand and Monath and another paper by them, oh. um, the, the Quiet Life Hypothesis published in the JPE saying that, you know, what happens when managers face less career pressure? And the argument is that they kind of are more, um, you know, susceptible to a quiet life, which which is, you know, which I think is a totally plausible story, which is like, if you don't have someone breathing down your neck, you'll tend to be a little bit lazier, right? And so they find that like, there's less productivity uh, that goes on at firms, but they kind of like fire people less and close plants less, right? Yeah. Um, and, and then finance people use these, you know, as you know, when there's some law that you can code that's already coded for you, you can yep. use it as a shock for a million different things. Right. But the problem is the law people came in shortly afterwards and said this makes no sense like just mm -hmm. kind of institutionally because all these laws are passed but at the same time that these are passed something called the poison pill um is adopt is 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 held to be um legal by the delaware supreme court okay and what the poison pill does is essentially make all the rest of these statutes move okay so like they they they, they add very little on top of the poison pill is just way more powerful at doing what these statutes do and so they came in and said, you know, this is another example of economists and finance people coming into a legal question, not understanding the law and then just running with it. Right? right. And so there was a paper written by some law professors who both have PhDs saying, look, uh, I actually edit. I was a, a student editor. It was a law review article saying, you know, that it doesn't appear as though these things matter. And we look at a couple papers and uh, look, the, the results aren't really there. They're spurious. Um, and then there was another paper published in finance by Jonathan Karpoff and Michael Whitry saying, yeah, there's something to that critique, um, but there still is something there, even if we adjust for the things that the lawyers are, are pointing out. OK. Oh, okay. Um, and so th that came out and Charlie Wang, my co-author, was like, you know, still unclear why, you know, why is, if the lawyers are right, this shouldn't matter. And the finance people are still saying that there's something there. And so the question, I this was probably just from Twitter. I had seen all this stuff. I was like, well, maybe it's the fact they're all difference and difference papers, and maybe it's a difference and difference issue. So we started that project thinking we were going to write just about about that topic, like to to bring in this question. Could we help resolve this debate by mm -hmm. just the fact that maybe the difference and differences are messed up, right? Yeah. A lot of these papers didn't even do event studies, right? So they're just looking pre-post. It could be explained by a bajillion things. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's how it started. But then we realized, like, kind of digging into figuring out how this worked, which was fun, right? I started off by just, like, writing a blog post trying to figure it out. And then, like, a bajillion That's how people... it started? 
Yeah, I just, you used to do all those all the time, or you did them. Yeah, all the time. I just like wrote a blog post about it and got like, I don't know, like just people were just that this was before Pedro and everybody had written explainers and it was there was just Baker dot do Baker dot do. This is massive <laughs> demand for like figuring out. And I just wrote a little simulation study and like trying to figure out how this works um, yeah. because I don't really prefer to do the algebra like 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 Bacon. I prefer to just kind of simulate data on my computer and have it tell me what happens. Yeah. Um, but yeah, anyways, we started writing that paper and pretty much realized that like it was too many bridges being crossed by both kind of methodologically showing how it happens and then doing this anti-takeover specific application that had like so many moving parts to it. Um, so then we just decided let's find some other papers that are in finance that are um, that use difference and difference and just try to show that does this matter? Because sometimes, you know, I, you know, we find these things, we know there's a problem you know, you're clustering at the wrong level, but like, does it necessarily really make a difference? Yeah. It makes a difference if you think that like the 10% or 5% significance threshold really matters, given that like it's arbitrary. You you know, a lot of, and not trying to critique it, but a lot of times it's like, well, the significance went from 94 to 89. And it's like, okay, well, I don't know. Um, it doesn't change my priors that much mm -hmm. versus uh, is this substantively important? And I think this yeah. is a debate you're seeing in a lot of, other fields now. I mean, I think a lot of other fields are finding that it doesn't seem to matter. Yeah. Uh, the new kind of difference in differences for at least for us, all the papers we looked at, it, it seemed to make a big difference. Um, what does that mean to make a big difference? I think that's the key point here too. So one of the papers we looked at, it makes a massive difference by any way you look at it, like the signs flip, right? Like it's, 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 oh, well, I mean, not necessarily signs, it's a null effect, but like, if you look at the event study, before kind of adjusting for these things. And part of the thing is, right, there's so many things with the difference of difference. Like if you're doing like the binning of the endpoints, like yeah. you know, it was fun to learn all this stuff that's going, it makes a massive difference above and beyond doing Pedro's fix, right? Yeah. And yeah. if you just fully saturate the event study, like in some cir circumstances, especially in your when everyone gets treated, it's going to make a huge effect, right? Yeah. And so part of it is, you know, there's a good paper coming out in political science about this saying that it doesn't seem to matter that much. Um, but but it doesn't matter much when you look at the, just the sign of the 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 static two way fix effect. But like if it messes up the the trends entirely, yeah. Like it then introduces the idea of the selection bias might be there. Yeah, or just like what is like the way I think about it is like the Roth and Rambachan like, yeah. like like extrapolating out the pre trends. If the pre trends are now completely different, then like what we think that treatment effect is is going to be completely different, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if, mm -hmm. if that line changes, even if it's still post minus pre is positive or negative. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So we ended up like with that paper, we found that it did for a few papers that were pretty influential in, in finance in different areas. It, it seemed to matter. Um, so what happens? You start growing the number. You guys, you guys set out to do something modest. And then what happens? It starts to kind of feel like you've got to do something even more expansive. A lot more papers get brought in or something. No, it was more just like what we wanted to find was papers where we could turn the fewest dials as possible, right? I, I find when you're doing this type of paper where you're trying to show that something matters, you don't want to have to change three things because then everybody says, well, which one of these three? Which one of these things? One? Right. So what we wanted to find was papers where they were they were good papers, right? Yeah. They were published in good journals. Like there was reason to believe that they're well done. I mean, they were well done, like as of like the standards at the time for all the papers we looked at. Mm -hmm. um, but where this issue popped up and we could show cleanly step by step, like what happens if you, you know, I do an event study, what happens if you do an event study and you don't bin, but you saturate. And then what happens if you finally do kind of like the approach that avoids the negative weighting, right? We wanted to be able to walk people through it. Yeah, With yeah, the takeover yeah. context, there's a lot of other things that aren't important now. So that's kind of, I've spun off as a separate paper mm -hmm. um, that, that I think you need to take into consideration a lot of these other, other aspects of it. And it just, yeah for the, the kind of pedagogical value of explaining the, mm -hmm. you know, at that point in time when people still didn't really realize what the new methods were, we wanted something where we had examples that were just kind of clean and easy to make one modification to. Yeah. 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 Well, so like, I mean, I know it wins an award and it gets published in such a great journal, but like quality, how, how have you noticed its influence within your community, within your scholarly community? Yeah. I don't, you know, look, I, um, I know it's got like surging sites and stuff, but like, do people, do you feel like people are like, man, we got to take this pretty seriously, even outside of this topic? I don't know. You know, I mean, I think it's unclear to me. I mean, I, so our paper, we ended up doing mostly about finance papers. I'm not a finance 
professor. Um, and so, uh, you know, the paper did win an award. It has a lot of sites. Presumably, I think in finance, just like in all of the econ fields now, like if you're doing a difference in difference, you probably have to do one or other of the methods. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, how much has it changed the practice? I'm not I'm not totally positive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's certainly made a, a big difference in my life. Uh, yeah. you know, and to the point that I'm a little sheepish about it because I like the paper. Don't get me wrong. Like I spent a bunch of time doing it. But I think it was I think it was a useful contribution. But like people know me as like a staggered difference to difference guy, and it's like that's not I, I'm not Pedro. I don't you know what I mean? I, I I didn't spend a bunch of time econometrically decomposing this. I kind of was just interested in and did something I thought would be helpful. Um, and so you know I do I think that that was maybe the best paper published in corporate finance that year. I don't know, probably not. But like I don't know, they voted it. So I you know I it's, it's like you know we can talk about it, but. You know, people send me stuff where EGMR people are crapping on me and like, oh, he's just a stupid replication paper. And it's like, I think you're right. Like, you know, what I, mean? I don't know what to tell you. Like, I didn't yeah. give myself the award. Um, so, like, you know, I think. Well, you were part of that way. You know, you you've been an important part. Not to belabor this, but you know, you you've been an important part of the of that growing wave of kind of being aware of that. Well, I mean, you mentioned this paper that's coming out where they're like, this stuff's not a big deal. And you're like, well, it's a pretty big deal in this area. And it's a pretty big deal under these specific conditions that are kind of we do know, you know, we kind of knew it was like this. When everybody gets treated, it's going to be a really big deal and stuff like that. And that's a lot of the papers. Yeah, look, I think that the value that I bring to this stuff is just like uh, being able to like communicate fairly. Well. Yeah. Like, uh, you know what I mean? I think if you talk about it and I think that now the econometrics field puts a lot more weight on this. Than they uh -huh. used to. I mean, you see Pedro doing, spending all this time doing yeah. this, teaching classes, focusing on it. I don't think historically that was the case at all, right? I mean, yeah. I think first off, like writing code didn't get you any benefit. Um, writing like a super obtuse papers that people can't read. I mean, the point of me writing that like blog post the first time was to be like, all right, we've got four different papers. Like, what's going on here? I spent time trying to figure it out, and I was like, I might as well write it down because yeah. they all use different notation. They're using different theorems. It's hard to figure out like what is actually different between this one and this one. What are they saying? Yeah. Um, I think my training as like kind of a, more of a generalist and somebody who teaches at a law school, but can kind of read these papers and spends time thinking about it, you know, um, that I can kind of take it and write it for the, the common man, which I consider myself, right? Versus mm -hmm. the kind of thinking man of, you know, the, the, the super smart econometricians. I think that that was like the sole value of where I came in and why I was able to like, you know, bring any value at all was just kind of trying to explain it and show it through graphs and plots in ways that I think made it clear to people like, oh, this isn't really that complicated. It's just yeah. you're making bad comparisons. And if you're not careful, you're going to make bad comparisons. You're yeah, making yeah. more bad comparisons if everyone's treated than if not everyone's treated. You know, yeah. it's not that hard of a concept, but it's sometimes hard for people who, again, like have PhDs in very focal, like, you know, focused fields. And then they have to try to explain it to somebody who doesn't, you know, like that's part of the downside of like the specialization, I think, of, of our fields, you know? You know, I mean, it's kind of funny now that I, hadn't really thought about because i know your you know your story but like that thing i was saying which is you sort of have this smart common sense you know there's a kind of common sense approach that's very dismissive that's like i don't want to have to learn anything and i'm just like none of, you know and you're just dismissive but you've yeah. kind of got this like intelligent common sense and a level of confidence that you know and you sort of then put in the work to kind of really dig dig pretty deep into it um, you know, seems like it's weirdly enough kind of came together in that paper and even kind of, you know, just like a kind of a, I mean, it's funny. I actually kind of think, I didn't really think about this, but you, one of the things that's always impressed me is you're just kind of like, well, I don't really care what the answer is. I just want to get it right. I mean, look, I think for us, I mean, the, the so the first time that I ever really got nailed on EJMR, I was drunk tweeting, um, which as you know, as you know, like as, as as can happen sometimes, it's not always the greatest mix, but I like bitched about people who don't want to get the right answer on the stuff. Like, I feel like for us is like reduced and people are like, who the hell does he think he is saying this? And it was totally fair. I conceded it. I was like, it was a bad tweet. But like, for us as like reduced form people, like, if you don't want to get the fucking answer, then like, why are we doing what we're doing? Like, now, don't get me wrong. I just like I don't have normative priors more than most people on things and choose what to study. But like, if you're going to bring data to it, like, 
if if you know something could be getting the wrong answer, like wouldn't you want to fix it? Like I don't know. I feel like well, it doesn't us- seem like your identity is all wrapped up in it. That's the thing I was trying to say is like because you don't seem to have this like well, I'm a I'm a blank ist or whatever you know you like you're kind of you know you don't your identity is not really wrapped up in like that's i can't even remember how you the, that management question you're like look i mean whatever it is it is and, and so you don't seem to have as much at stake yeah i mean in, i don't want to over it. yeah i don't want to oversell that i mean i think i do have strong claims on the things that i care about but i think that they're not data like i i actually view a right. very big distinction between because like i'm in the law right so a lot of the work that lawyers like legal academics do is purely normative stuff right about wow. like i think this is what the law should be I think, you know, I'll give you claims about what I think corporate law should be about. Um, what do I think the duties of managers to society vis-a-vis shareholders should be? I have very strong thoughts on that that I aren't hidden. But those are like, right, like, like anybody else in my field can adjudicate that dispute with me by based on like just our common knowledge of the law, the situation um, versus once you start bringing data to the question, right? Like, and I think this is a big area where empirical stuff has come into the law. Then you're kind of talking over the heads of your colleagues who don't do data stuff. And they're like, oh, well, I have to defer to, you know, this. And at that point, if you're not getting it right, I just find it to be like, just super disingenuous, right? Yeah. It's like, you can have questions about about policy and about what's right and what's wrong based on social norms, um, where we can all, like, it's, it's easy for everyone, like the cards are on the table. I think once you start bringing like the empirical veneer on it, you then give it this gloss of like, this is just objective, right? This is just the objective facts of what the data show. As we know, that's like usually not true. And then and then at least it needs to be that you're trying to get it right. And so I get frustrated when it's like, I don't wanna learn new stuff. And it's like, well, if you don't learn new stuff, then you're getting the data question wrong, right? Like, and I, I just feel like for us as applied people, you know, there's a little bit of this, like the world's gotten so easy for us lately. You know what I mean? Where it's like, we expect all the econometricians to write down packages that cleanly estimate everything for us. And we get mad if we don't read the, the, you know, the help file that explains what's happening. And, you know, it's kind of like, I feel like as empirical people, it's on you to understand what your estimator is doing. Mm-hmm. And so, I, you know, whatever, like people think it's a high horse. I, it's just like, I, and part of it, it's a downfall for me. Sometimes I, I don't get as much stuff done because I spend way too much time, like thinking about what the newest, you know, trying yeah. to zoom off or inbends paper because they come out every 14 days. And so, you know, it's like there needs to be a balance between like you got to take a stand and do the best you can do, but you also have to do the work to figure out and not just rely on like I typed in DID in the computer and like this is what it tells me. Like you should understand what your estimator is doing because otherwise like we're not adding much value. Uh, yeah, yeah not- totally, totally. Hey, can, can, this this new paper, you know, the one I've been bugging you about because you like told me about it. Is it okay if you sort of share a little bit about that? Is it too premature? No, yeah, we can we can talk about it. We're hoping to have a draft ready soon. Um, so yeah, this is kind of one of these areas of like uh, of papers that I do, which is just kind of looking at the way that we do stuff in the law. Yeah. Um, especially the things that are passed to courts when there's kind of some kind of statistical evidence that gets used and trying to think, you know, the way I usually frame it to people is like, if I were passing this idea to my econometrics professor, you know, what yeah. would he, what would he say is like the, the way, the way to do it. think about this problem, right? Not that it's like the perfect way, but just like, you know, if I didn't tell him any of the details, but I was thinking about all the training that I got, like right. how would you ask a question like this? And yeah. it turns out that like a lot of the ways that we that we're doing in court, because there's this kind of path dependency and things that have been happening for 15, 20 years have become super ossified and, and, and they don't really make a ton of sense, right? Mm-hmm. And so in this case, there's a lot of um, litigation around the valuation of public firms, okay? So you can imagine like the Elon Musk and Twitter example as kind of the first case where I was starting to play around with this data, you know, people wanted to know what was gonna be the walk away price of Twitter if Elon Musk backed out of the deal when he was yeah. trying to get out of the Twitter deal, right? Mm-hmm. Because why did people want to know that at that point in time? Because they wanted to know what the implied market probability was that the deal was going to go through. Mm. Right. Because everybody said, oh, like the deal, the deal price is for 50 or what did he do it for 40, 20, right? Or like 420, 40, yeah. 20, whatever it was, something, right. something weed. Um, so that was the price, but the stock was trading below that. So everybody was saying, well, uh, you know, that means the market is expecting that this deal is not going to go through because otherwise it would get arbitraged away. And what you need to know to say that is, well, what would be the walkaway price 
if what is Twitter's kind of standalone value if there's no deal? And it turns out after Elon Musk had made his offer, the stock market had collapsed for tech companies. It was like around COVID and stuff. So and supply chain issues and whatever else was going on in the market. So it's actually just kind of like this is just a kind of data science prediction problem. The way I view it, right, is like, all right, well, we know their peer firms all collapse in value. Let's just do something like a synthetic control to say um, before all of this happened, before the market collapsed, can we model Twitter's stock price as some function of kind of what's going on generally in the market and a bunch of these other tech peers, assume that that relationship would be somewhat stable had all this not happened, and then extrapolate out the value of the price um, uh, given what happened to the peer firms, and then look at that as the standalone price and try to back out some, some takeover probabilities, which, mm. you know, I thought was an interesting exercise. And then it kind of made me think, you know, in these cases that get brought to court all the time, we do something that's like very, very similar to kind of almost a KNN algorithm is what we're arguing in the paper. Mm. So you say, all right, we want to know the value of this firm. Something happened to the firm that makes us not believe the market price. Um, but we want to know what the value would have been had that not happened. Let's look for like the closest five peer firms. Um, we you know decide what are the closest firms based in completely arbitrary ways that allow all this discretion from experts. Judges get frustrated because both sides pick different comparable. Is that firms. where the bias centers in mainly? Is picking the the yeah picking the comparison group picking the comparison group right? And now you could all there's also some like uh, discounted cash flow methods where you're kind of projecting out cash flows into the future, but there you still end up needing to use a comparable analysis for the comparable, the right discount rate. You look at the discount rate of the peers, right? And so, yeah, you're, you're picking out what are the comparable firms. And so my the idea was, well, why don't we just pick the firms based on how well they co-move before this happened? It's just a more, at least I can explain what that is. There's an objective criterion that you can give to judges, which is prediction error. All right. Is it the perfect answer? No. But is it much better and much more uh, like kind of subject to uh, judicial oversight than is what we do now, which is, well, he says that Burger King is not really a good peer for McDonald's because they also have a big chicken sandwich business. You know, it's just like kind of like, why does any of this matter when all we're trying to do is value the firm like they right. finding the perfect peer doesn't matter. Right. And so in this paper, we kind of use more or less the Inbens Duchenko version. Of I was just about to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Because like firms are on far different scale, don't want to like have the convex hole requirement of like making sure and normalizing in the right way. So I I like the like you know just throw elastic net on the return series um, and get get the peers um, and use that. And then we do a bunch of simulation analyses and we show that it does way better um, and has less variance and mm. um, give you better estimates that you know each little minor change in that will be much smaller will lead to much smaller changes than changes with matching to peers based on kind of arbitrary characteristics. But you're doing some kind of synthetic control. So you you are kind of projecting a counterfactual, but it's based off the, the dynamics in the before period. Yeah. yeah, yeah exactly. that yeah, it's using the time series instead of instead of just using the one point in time. Oh, well, I get it. They were just doing point in time uh, that might be something they're like picking the comparison group, they're not even doing diff and diffs or whatever. It's just like- No, exactly. It's like a oh. can algorithm, right? And then also because firms are of much different size, you yeah. need to scale the values by something like accounting earnings. Mm -hmm. So you look at something like a price to earnings ratio. So you get kind of measurement error both in that, that you have to map to the ratio and then you have to back it out from the ratio. We say, just use the value, use a model that allows an intercept to allow for scale differences, Mm. And we do it better, right? And so we're trying to bring in a little more stuff on um, some some actual case examples. Um, but I think we're we're pretty close to having a draft ready. And and hopefully, I mean, the big thing is, can we explain this to judges and juries? I was uh, just about to say that. I mean, part of the thing about this K nearest neighbors, yeah, is uh, that like matching is so easy to explain to a normal person. Yeah, I mean, people do. It's not. You're saying it's not even really matching though, but it's like saying you know here's a bunch of things that are normal what what are you we, when you think about the divide of like doing better and better work and you sort of mentioned a minute ago like having to read pretty pretty deep and technical work do you feel like you're you start moving further and further away from the audience where uh, you're know, trying to explain this kind of thing is going to be is its own art form 
Yeah, I mean, I it is totally like I I actually just presented this paper to like our full faculty at the law school yesterday. And so I had yeah. to spend a lot of time on like pretty figures and explaining, but I think it's good, right? I mean, I yeah. think the point is to try, at least for us, the work I'm doing is trying to be policy relevant in the litigation space. Yeah. Um, you need to be able to explain it to judge and jury, right? Exactly. And so I think that's the risk because I said, look, if you were to do this, if I presented this to some data science people, I'm sure they could come up with some deep learning algorithm that could beat this by a little bit. Probably not yeah. a ton, given the way financial markets work, yeah. but a little yeah. bit. But then you have this black box algorithm that has all these downsides. What's nice is you have this constraint within the law world that I have like this shadow price of like making something more and more complex is going to really start to bind. And so you're trying to trade off these things of coming up with like the best answer you can, but with something that you can defend and explain. And now I think we're, we're getting up on the edge of that being difficult in this paper, but mm -hmm. I think it's a little oversold. Everybody thinks that it's going to be too complicated, but like we already have models where we're running regression estimates in the litig securities litigation space where we do something very similar um and two people will argue about why their model's better because of the adjusted r squared and like do i think the judges and juries understand the asymptotics of like the beta coefficients between two competing models no and i actually think reframing this as a prediction error thing mm. is, is our way of trying to say which of these two competing models does a better job predicting the price series beforehand if you yeah. frame it like that, I think you can actually really explain that um, mm. to to like a you know a smart and uh, thoughtful judge who is trying hard to get the right answer. Mm -hmm. If they can do that, then I, I I don't if they can look at regressions, I don't see why they can't kind of look at this as a prediction error problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. You look at lasso or penalized regression. It's the same thing as a regression. It just adds a penalty term on it. It it yeah. can't be that much more complicated, right? right. And um, what it does it ends up picking up or just kind of like a lower dimensional set of factors typically. Um, and so these things just end up being a lot more stable than- But you know, know Andrew, when you think back at the diff and diff stuff and the two-way fixed effects, even amongst PhD economists, there was like a folklore almost understanding of OLS, of what it was doing. And the new methods are kind of interesting because even something like Callaway and Santana, which is just like, you know, just go back and do regular diff and diffs and just, you know, wait them, wait them and, uh, yeah. you know, find the right control group. It's been sort of something that's kind of wild to watch people sort of prefer what, you know, you could argue that two way fixed effects is, is way more complicated. Yeah. It's no, much it more deeper and deeper and very black box. And so I was just thinking like, juries and judges might not be so different than yeah. like the, they they actually might like the thing that is way more complicated and not realize mm -hmm. that it's more complicated in the be uh, and they don't they don't know how it's much true. I mean, it yeah. it's a good it's a good metaphor or analogy i guess um i, I think there's something to that right because like, like you said i mean when i try to explain this to people what's interesting is i just taught diff and diff and iv and this stuff to law students for this seminar series that we're running and, you know, it's actually like when you actually go and explain diff and diff from the from the studs to these people, you're like, it's just these difference of two means. And like, it would be way easier to explain Pedro's paper from that yep. if you were not like starting from a world of getting in theta and running Y equals, you know, uh, X1 plus X2 plus D. You know what I mean? Like, like that is the problem is that we kind of put the, the cart before the horse in yep. a lot of ways. And so like, actually, like you said, I totally agree that Pedro's method is it is the answer to what is a different difference of other times. Now, the other approaches, and I'm not trying to like spread them, like they are potentially better because they like minimize variance using OLS. But like you said, that's actually a more complicated story. Like mm -hmm. you should, like, you know, if you just care about calculating means, you should do that. Um, yeah. But, and what, what I find hard now is like, I actually have had to code Pedro's entire thing up by hand. Um, it is a pain. Um, because you care only if you care about inference, because like the influence yeah. functions. Are you got hard. to learn what an influence function was, though. You I didn't know what that was before. Yeah, I had to do it. Or you were math. good at math. You probably, you probably knew. No, I didn't know. <laughs> it makes sense what you want. Once you like, they tell you what it is. Um, like it's like the you know, uh, one observation contribution to whatever the overall estimate is. But uh, but yeah, no, like 
that part's hard. But if you were to just care about just the coefficients in the plots, yeah. it's, mm -hmm. it's literally like, you know, those like, things taking means, subtracting them. It's not, it's not that complicated. Yeah. Um, versus like, yeah, like actually going through and understanding what the imputation is. Like you can get what that is from a, if you really know regressions and you use it a lot. If you were to explain that to my law students who've never run regressions, they would be way more confused by that, right? Yes. Would, wait, how does this map to um, mm. what you told me? Why is it that I care about two different levels of fixed effects. Like I yeah. try to explain, like we do regression difference and difference solely because it's easier and it gives us standard errors, but it's not actually easier intuitively in any way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally, totally. So yeah, I don't know, like that pedagogy, I feel like you end up in all of our conversations, you're really interested in this stuff. I kind of gloss over it eventually. I mean, I think there are interesting ideas in terms of like how pedagogical changes influence the way we think about how to do things and what's important. Um, yeah. But, you know, I think about it for two minutes and then I. Uh, yeah, uh, then you. Right. Well, uh, you know, this season on the podcast, I'm doing like more of the students of person. Yeah. And, you know, uh, it's like Card, Angerson, Embits. But in a way, like I could say you're part of the series because Hito was kind of your one of your parents, your like advisor. Right. He wasn't yeah. you didn't was it your chair, but he was you learned a lot from him and he was on your committee. Is that right? He was not, no, he wasn't on my committee. Oh, he uh, wasn't on the committee? No, no, no. But I took like four classes with him. He's actually coming and talking to my law students uh, on uh, on Monday. Um, you know, Hito is a great guy. Uh, yeah, I, I, you know, knew nothing about any of these kind of like modern statistical learning things that I tend to just be using now in all my papers because I find them to be more intuitive for the problem that I have at hand, right? Um, and that was all because I just pretty much had him four different times for, yeah, for yeah. classes and, and that's what he was working on so yeah i mean am i a, an embed student i don't think he'd want to take me necessarily on his <laughs> team uh, i think you should talk to dimitri or some of his full-time students but yeah i would love to be you know i mean he's someone who i would say was extremely formative in the way that i think about attacking problems more so than um anybody else i would say um so, you know, in terms of introducing me to other ways of thinking about things, um, instead of just kind of running through and starting with, mm. you know, and ending with some, you know, linear regression equation, um, which again, I don't think that there's something wrong with that, but I think uh, his kind of the way he did his classes, I thought was really effective in, in explaining to us kind of how the different approaches map to each other when you want to use mm. one. And, you know, I still go back to my homework exercises sometimes in terms of how to figure out stuff because he had us code all this stuff up. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and he's also we we've, we've talked about this. I mean, just genuinely one of the nicer. He's nicer so people. nice. I know he's just ridiculously nice. Uh, well, let me let me end this. Okay, so so you know you you there's a kid out there who's just like you. They're 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 not like figured out their life when they're a senior in high school and have like made every decision after that that's like correct. They're like have graduated uh college or they're kind of in between and you have this opportunity maybe it's even you you know you're like meeting yourself and it's you you know what do you what do you think now that you look back you know what do you think that you'd like to kind of share to to somebody like that that was like you about you know what what to think about you know the stuff that's coming or the stuff that you know, when that person's kind of down and frustrated and watching all these other people, what feels like they're lapping them, what do you want to say to that person that's like, thinks they're getting lapped? Yeah, I don't know, honestly, because like, I would like to, you know, you learn from your life, but but recognizing the stochastic nature of it all. Like, I am just really be honest to feel so insanely fortunate um, to be where I'm at. Like, I don't think that my life was guaranteed to go in this way by by any stretch of the imagination. Doesn't mean that I didn't work hard. Yeah. But if we're being honest, like a lot of things fell my way. I mean, one thing is I you get this advice a lot from people, but it's totally true. Is like find good mentors helped mm -hmm. me a ton. If I think about all the times that people helped me get to where I'm at, um, mm -hmm. you know, just amazingly lucky. But also people don't help you unless you ask them. Right. Yeah. So reach out, try to find people, ask for help. Uh, it's a big one. But I mean, I do worry. I, I, I don't tell people to follow my path because, you know, the world's changed a lot since then. I do. We talked about this earlier. I do worry that, like, you can't be 23 and not have known what you wanted to do anymore, necessarily. Now, yeah. you know, everyone getting into top 
PhD programs has done two years of pre-docs and has a published paper and all this. And like, you know, look, that's just the way the world is going to work when you have um, a limited number of slots that are getting competed on by people like you, there's no point in like wish casting in that way. Yeah. But it does have real costs in the sense that we are one expecting kids to know at a really young age, what it is they want to do. And two, we're almost certainly missing out on like people coming up who could be, you know, very successful yeah. um, in particular people who would bring different, I think, perspectives and vantage points versus people who have known and have tunnel vision, what they want to do for so long. And I'm not saying tunnel vision in a pejorative sense, like they, you know, you should reward people for being driven and having a goal. Um, but if they all end up just kind of reading the same papers and thinking the same way, what's that going to mean in 20, 30 years? I don't know. You know, so yeah. Uh, I don't have a great answer besides, you know, try to try to reach out and, and get, you know, get help from from other people and, and rely on other people's advice and and don't hesitate to kind of ask people for help. Yeah. Well, you know, um, this is the story. The podcast is kind of uh, funny, but it's like the story of living stories of living economists, personal stories of living economists. And in a way, um I think that diff and diff paper has kind of made you in our tribe. And I know that probably hurts a little bit to think that, you know, you've kind of got this brand on you now yeah. that you're kind of this like honorary doctorate in economics, but it, it, it seems like it's, you kind of, some of us kind of want to claim you as, you know, as one of the good ones. Yeah. We talk about this. I, I know what you're trying to go me into. Uh, look, I mean, I, at the end of the day, I get great joy in um, finding spots to pick, picking my spots in yeah. crapping on economics. Um, <laughs> at the end of the day, obviously, look, I like gained a ton from economics as a field. Um, I do essentially applied economics right. as, as a topic, as what I do. Um, you know, but I, I do think that the field has some very big blind spots that they're oblivious to. Sometimes. You know what? You know what? You know what, Andrew? I bet you you could take the next paper you need to write is um, take an elastic net and then see if you can't figure out a more accurate measure of the statistical value of life. That would probably be that's what might be missing. That's all that's missing. Right? <laughs> it's, it's just it's just a, a better way to uh, to look at. Oh, I see. I know I, now I know how your brain works. That's, so that's just, like, now look at the look at the plumbers in Nashville versus uh, versus, you know, Waco and then just kind of impute the fact that. <laughs> You know, you're just you're just a less valuable human than we are, you know, in the other civilized parts of the world. So oh, sorry about that, guys. You know, <laughs> just just it's just economics. Can't fight science. That's what I'm be, so. <laughs> All right, man. It was Bye. so good to see you. Uh, it's it's always so much fun to talk to you. you Thanks too, so buddy. Much for being on it. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.